what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. As you listen to this interview, I just want to give a quick shout out. Um, This is about top grading. This is about hiring top talent, which um, every company that I talk to that um, really wants to grow and thrive really focuses in on hiring top talent. So you're going to like this one. Uh, Check out the book, um, Top Grading um, by Brad Smart. Brad Smart wrote the book, Top Grading, and is the founder. And um, I in this interview, Chris Mersaw, who's the president of Top Grading, um, who's been doing this since 2001, gives some amazing tips. Listen to the part where he talks about Torque, which is T-O-R-C, um, which is um, part of their filtering process and some of the big mistakes people make with hiring that and much more coming up right now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And if you've listened to any episodes before, you've heard um, some people you've heard of, some people you've never heard of. And, and Chris, what I like to talk about is some of the interesting, challenging stories that people have. So P90X founder, Tony Horton, yeah, he talked about, he's obviously sold millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of DVDs, but he talked about when he was a, uh, making food and rent money as a street mime on the street. Uh, and that's how he made his food and rent money originally. And um, Nolan Bushnell, uh, the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese, he was Steve Jobs' mentor. He talked about not only when he lost everything and he had to take his whole family, he said, as a trip around the world and they had to stay at different people's houses because they lost everything, and, but no one knew anything different because he just pulled in some favors. And um, Steve Jobs also early on offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Um, that and many more stories you can check out inspiredinsider.com uh, for more interviews. And today's episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25 I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, um, and we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners by helping you run your podcast so that it generates ROI. Um, for me, you know, podcasting is much more personal than just business. Obviously, I believe it's the best thing. I've been doing this over 10 years and it's been the best thing I've done for my business and my life because of the relationships I've made. I've gone on vacations with people. I've gone to weddings and have best friends and obviously formed business relationships as well. But it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were concentration camp in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany and they were the only members of their family to survive. But the point of it is the leg, their legacy lives on, his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with my grandfather and I can watch that. I put it on my about page of my website of Inspired Insider, um, the short version and the long version. I watch it multiple times a year just to have gratitude and appreciation for what I have in my life and what he went through that allows me to do this. Um, so that interview um, I consider podcasting uh, letting me leave a legacy for my guests and myself. So it's much more personal to me than just the business side of things. So if you have questions about podcasting, I believe any business should have a podcast period. And I was saying that, by the way, Chris, before we even had a service that did that for people. Um, I'm sure you're the same with uh, hiring right, which we'll talk about. But um, if you have questions, go to Rise25 or email support at rise25media.com. And um, I am really excited to talk to today's guest because um, really, in my opinion, and I think, I don't know if it's in my opinion, but the most important thing in any business is the people. And you can't run your business without people. And what, what um, Chris is going to talk about is how do you get A players on the bus and hire the right people and that will allow you to run your company. And before I introduce Chris, I want to thank um, Chris Snyder who runs and owns banks.com. Um, and he, you know, the Chris I'm talking to now mentioned top grading as his gold standard. He's like, anyone who is a company needs to read top grading, needs to look into top grading. That's the gold standard for hiring. And you can check out Chris Snyder uh, showdown. That's his podcast. He's talked about top grading and we've talked about it together. So you can check that out as well. So thank you, Chris, for, making sure everyone knows about 
Chris Snyder. Uh, everyone knows about top grading. And today's guest is Chris Mersaw. He's president of top grading. He's been helping companies and individual, individual managers how to pack their teams with A players since 2001. And he's conducted over 2,500 in-depth top grading assessments. He's helped numerous people achieve their A potential through the top grading methodologies, which he will go through. There's certain secrets you can use immediately at no cost, which he's going to go through. Um, their client list includes companies like Mint, E-Trade, Culligan, thousands more. They serve Fortune 500 companies, small to medium-sized businesses, and nonprofit organizations. You may have heard of the book Top Grading, which it was so popular and well-received. It's in its third edition. It's called Top Grading, the proven hiring and promoting method that turbocharges companies' performance. I've listened to it um, one and a half times. Uh, it's fantastic. And um, the vision of Top Grade the World is intended to help managers everywhere hire better. And we'll talk about some of those secrets that they use and what they recommend. So, Chris, thank you for joining me. Hey, my pleasure, Jeremy. I'm happy to be here. You know, I wanted to start off with, and you, you've lived and breathed this for decades, okay? But just start off, give people a little bit about the philosophy of top grading to start. Wonderful. And so our philosophy starts with uh, setting a goal, especially for hiring, but really for um, really talent across or in through an organization. Um, and that is to set the bar much higher than it is today. You know, and for most managers, that bar is at average. And if you get a hire or you promote someone, and they turn out to be, you know, average or slightly above average, uh, you know, most managers are relatively happy because they've also experienced the opposite where they've made those uh, new hires and promotions and those uh, people turned out to be much below average. And the bar is like, I've experienced a nightmare. As long as it's not that, I'm fine. Exactly. Fine is, you know, is good, you know, for, for most of those people placement decisions. And our philosophy at top grading is uh, you know, to hire and promote uh, people who are in the top 10% of talent available for the pay. And to put that another way, um, right now, if you have someone who is not in the top 10% of talent available for the pay, you're actually paying for those results and behaviors, um, but you're not getting them if you don't have someone who is in the top 10%. And so that's where our philosophy starts with. It starts with you know, setting that bar, both as an organization, but individually for everyone in the company at top 10% of talent available. Um, so it's a high performer, but also a high performer who fits your culture well as a good member of the team. Uh, because you know, often when uh, you say a player, you hear a player, it's, you, know, you, you get, uh, it's usually a picture of the top salesperson. And, you know, that person can sell a lot, but they're really a jerk. And, you know, in our definition of a player, you need to be a great culture fit and great member of the team and deliver uh, a great results or you're not an A player. Is there anything else that people in your definition of a player um, that people should consider? Or is it really, you know, people kind of normally just put that as, oh, you're a top performer, but they're not thinking of the culture fit. Is there anything else in the definition of a player people should consider? Yeah, those are the two big things. Now, mm -hmm. we also have um, in our definition, um, and I'll get to this in a second with how we operationalize that definition of a player, uh, but we also have other key characteristics and behaviors. So we have the results that are expected, uh, the culture fit, you know, for more, more, many companies, that's your core values. And so we actually list those core values because everyone in the company needs to be at least okay in those areas to be a, a, a good culture fit. Um, and then there are, of course, other behaviors and characteristics necessary to deliver the results that are expected. So, uh, you know, we really consider the whole person. I mean, we even go into uh, the fit with the manager because that's such an important piece to um, you know, a, an employee's job satisfaction is how they fit with that manager. And so we need to be sure those styles are um, complementary uh, so that, you know, it can be at least, uh, at least satisfying, you know, hopefully it's a little better than satisfying, but at least satisfying working on that team. What do you say to companies, Chris, that you mentioned this about, you know, an A player and in the book, it talks about, well, sometimes an A player can do the job of two to three you know, C or D or B players. 
And what do you say to companies that say, well, we only can afford this amount for this position. And, and you're saying, well, if you really want an A player, you're going to have to pay this amount. How do you navigate that with companies? Yeah, and so that's interesting, Jeremy. So another part of, uh, it's kind of inherent in our definition of A player, is that the definition of A player is different for almost every different organization. You know, so going back to the sales rep, you know, a sales rep for uh, a, you know, a small software company is the definition of a player for that company is different than a sales rep for, you know, an Oracle or um, you know, a, another larger software company. Yeah, those are two different things. They're interacting with different kinds of people potentially. And so we need to be sure we're looking for an A player at the right level. So part of our definition of A player is for, uh, for the pay. So that means get the best people you can for what you can't afford. Now, I'm not saying that you're not paying too low because that's, that's a, a problem. You know, we have uh, clients who are looking for, uh, you know, looking for, you know, it's an overused uh, metaphor, but I'm going to use it anyway. You know, they have champagne taste, but a beer budget. And so, you know, you need to know if, if, if beer is okay and you can get the job done with beer, uh, it's fine to pay, you know, and have your pay there. But if you really need, um, you know, more results, better results, different results, it may make sense to pay a little bit more. Uh, the thing is, we're objective about that. And we really define a player based on the business results. And then when we go out to the market and begin interacting with candidates, you know, and understand what we can get for the pay, it may mean that we have to increase that pay a little bit. But what we, what we find so often is that is a cop out. You know, that uh, it, it's hard to find people, you know, not so much in today's market right now, but, you know, a, a month ago and for the previous 10 years, um, it was really a seller's market in terms of candidates because there were fewer candidates than necessary. Um, and if you wanted a job, you were employed. It was difficult to get those people. And so often we find, you know, we have to pay more is the quick answer. That's not always the case. You know, so often it's you have to look harder and be a bit more creative in the looking because those people are out there. They just happen to be employed and they're not looking for your job at. What do you find are good? Are there any good tips about attracting A players? Uh, yeah, there, there are. And the first, uh, the first place we start is with your employer brand. Uh, most uh, career pages we go to as we're beginning to work with clients uh, need a lot of work. Uh, you know, we know that Glassdoor, that's a, 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 an avenue for people to maybe who have been fired or uh, who were nudged out to uh, air their grievances. But uh, new employees look at that. So, you know, your LinkedIn profile, uh, your Glassdoor profile, your careers page are all extremely important. And, uh, you know, if you have core values, living those core values, you know, so you have a culture that's attractive. And I understand that that's not a quick fix, but working to have a culture that's attractive for A players is really important. Uh, you know, now, down the line, and it's a bit of a circular definition, but we've also found that a strong team and having a lot of A players in the company actually attract other A's, um, both through referrals and just word of mouth. Uh, another thing that's really important is to uh, be sure that the job ads uh, that are posted are attractive. You know, so often we see a really boring job description cut and pasted into Indeed or LinkedIn or Zoom, or uh, not Zoom, but uh, a Zip Recruiter, and it's just boring. And, you know, it's really difficult to get a good feel for the company and a good feel for a job in all of those words. And so another strong recommendation is to, you know, put some marketing and some sales into your job ads so they're attractive and they stand out. Yeah, because most people don't put the time and effort they need to into those things. Right. And, and Jeremy, the, the other really important thing, too, I know there's a lot of companies uh, when they have an open position, they're sourcing that it really is putting job ads out on Indeed and ZipRecruiter and, and, and other places, posting those jobs. Uh, keep doing that, of course, but you're getting to a small uh, piece of the market you know, in terms of candidates when you're just posting job ads. So uh, strategies to get the attention of passive candidates who are working right now, but not necessarily looking for a job um, are really important to have, you know, and a really uh, straightforward one that everyone you know, has at least heard of and maybe even has and is utilizing are referral programs. Uh, those referral programs, uh, they need to have some kind of recognition, both uh, public recognition in the company and also, you know, 
some money or whatnot, you know, a, a reward. Some incentive. For, some incentive, absolutely. Uh, and you know, for some companies, they have large incentives for, uh, for referrals. Uh, we found though that almost as important is some kind of, you know, I'd say public recognition, but recognition in the company, uh, rewarding those people with that recognition for doing something that's so valuable to the success and the growth. Are there any other, so I like that. So, you know, cause if you have a town hall and you bring the person up and go, the most important thing is the people we're giving this person the metal, you know, a huge trophy and this reward. And, and that's obviously the recognition piece may go even further to their peers than, you know, a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or something like that. Absolutely. Have you seen any good exam, heard of any good, like over the top examples of companies with like how they've recognized staff are there any good stories in the that you've heard of or experienced i mean so we we go this is going this is going way back mm -hmm. uh but uh working for if, if anyone was from the chicago area uh dominic's in the 80s and 90s this is also a little bit before my time so it's a, it's, it's a secondhand story uh, but they would do actually what you just mentioned in monthly meetings uh those who referred and uh, uh got their referrals hired were recognized and you know they got there was a monetary it was maybe two hundred dollars um, you know so not a, not a huge uh, sum but they got the two hundred dollars in front of everyone and uh, you know there was a bit of a celebration around that so um, they really publicized that you know and marketed it internally so uh, that's another recommendation in terms of sourcing is to you know think about you know and it's not going to ever be this balanced but think about um, how you can put as much effort into attracting candidates as you do customers or clients. Mm. And you know, by putting that thought and some of that effort in, um, it can really be, uh, be valuable, have a big ROI. Any other, yeah, for some reason when you say that, I picture the movie Rudy and like people carrying, you know, at the end, if anyone's in Rudy, they carry Rudy off the field at the end. I picture like in the most extreme example, <laughs> just carrying the person. Quite that far, but that you're, you're right. thinking in the right direction. Right. Um, any other passive, uh, way to get passive, uh, passive ways to get candidates like that referral programs, any others that are people should think about? Yeah. So just thinking about, um, you know, recruiting, you know, sort of thinking about recruiting all day and every day, you know, not being obnoxious about it, but uh, you know, managers and, and really reinforcing that managers have their eye open for talent all the time. You know, so again, a pretty, pretty straightforward example, but um, if you need someone to, uh, interact with customers in kind of a customer service role of any kind. And, you know, you are at Starbucks or Home Depot or mm. your restaurant and you find someone who is wonderful, you know, that's a person to make a connection with. You know, maybe even uh, some of our clients actually have business cards that do double duty, recruiting on one side and, you know, their information on the other and have those cards ready to pass out and say, hey, we're always hiring. We're looking for people who are great with people. Uh, you know, uh, can we uh, can we exchange our information? Love to tell you a little bit more about it. That doesn't work all of the time, but those kinds of uh, activities and actions and just thinking about that yeah. is really no, that's really smart because I know I've been in, you know, some store and I'm like, wow, that person was so friendly. They were so nice. They had the best customer service. And if I would have thought at the time, oh, you know, just if you're ever looking in the future, maybe not now, that would be a perfect segue. And I'm sure they'll feel honored and special that you even mentioned that. And, you know, you never know. And they're already employed. So that, that's a great tip. I love that. Um, and one other, one other uh, thing, it's, it's been referred to as a virtual bench, uh, but it's doing this recruiting activity just consistently, you know, knowing that um, even if you, even if you don't have any openings right now, you will have openings at some uh, point in time, keeping your eye open and developing relationships with people. So when you do have an opening, you, know, you have some uh, candidates who are somewhat vetted uh, and you can approach them and say, Hey, we finally have an opening. Uh, you know, I think you'd be great for it and you can move really quickly and kind of be uh, recruiting off your front foot versus, you know, rushing and scrambling and uh, being kind of desperate when that job comes open. So, Chris, you know, we talked in the front of the, uh, the interview about some secrets people can use immediately at no cost. Um, I, I, don't, I won't necessarily lock you into no cost, but that's just uh, 
you know, in, in the communication, but what are some things people can use immediately to implement and start using top grading and hiring A players? Yeah, Jeremy, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the things they can do immediately uh, in the context of, you know, the, the, five, uh, the five key components of top grading and especially the top grading hiring process. Uh, and so there are definitely a couple of free things in here um, and actually several free things in here. Uh, so the first thing uh, and really the first hiring mistake is that uh, I'll say companies, especially even individual managers, don't really know who they're looking for. Hmm. And you know, it, it, it's evidenced by most job descriptions we see. You know, they're relatively vague. They create, have a lot of words in there. Uh, they cover a lot of breadth. And it's difficult to really understand exactly what that person is going to be held accountable for. And so that's the first hiring mistake. And actually the first key step of top grading is to you know, define what a player performance and behaviors are in that job in your company. And so we uh, call that a job scorecard and uh, recommend before you even start looking for people or posting jobs, you create that job scorecard. So the hiring manager is very clear and uh, whoever, if it's not the hiring manager screening candidates uh, is very clear and they have an accurate uh, filter with which to screen those candidates. So that's the first step. And actually I give a couple of uh, categories there uh, because that's something that uh, people can do for free. You can do that on your own. Uh, list the results you expect an A player to deliver with metrics. So percentages, dollar signs, due dates, uh, deadlines, uh, and list everything they need to do. You know, just results, not behaviors, not communicating, not uh, you know, being likable or resourceful. The results they expect that person to deliver. Once you understand what you expect in terms of results, the behaviors necessary to deliver those results will be much more evident. So do that, list it out and tell you and, and keep listing things until you can say, if the person does those things and only those things in the first year, I consider them a high performer and be you know, very happy uh, to have them on the team. The other important component, many companies already have this. Um, and if you don't describe your culture and for most companies, if you have core values, that should describe your culture or the culture you're working to build. And then think about what else the person needs to be excellent in when they walk in the door to be effective and be an A player and deliver those results. If you do those things, you know, those three categories, results, core values, and any other key competencies, um, you're really uh, a long way to defining A player. So you know you're pointed in the right direction, you know your target. Uh, the next thing, uh, and this is another free, uh, another free thing that people can start doing tomorrow. The problem is uh, we are screening candidates based on really erroneous or incomplete and sometimes inaccurate information because we get to know candidates up front, usually with their resume or their, their CV. And resumes are your candidate's sales brochure. So there's no law stating that every job a person has ever had uh, needs to be listed on a resume. You know, it doesn't, there's no law that even says the resume has to be true. And so we are going in, uh, you know, a, a not necessarily blindfolded, but at least looking through things uh, with, with blurry glasses. And we're not quite sure. A player's resumes look great because they've done a lot of great things. Non-A players' resumes can also look great because there's a lot of help on how to create a good resume. And so we need a way to uh, be able to rely on the information we're getting from clients. And uh, we have uh, a technique. We call it the TORC technique, T-O-R-C. Um, that stands for threat of reference check. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, it sounds a lot more ominous than it really is. It's really just letting candidates know early in the selection process that at the appropriate time, which is right before a job offer, yeah. um, that asked them to arrange for reference calls with former managers and maybe some others. So it's subtle, you know, it's more of a promise of a reference check uh, than, uh, than a threat, but threat is a- No, I get it. It sounds better. Right, right. But I mean, you exactly. could do it or not do it, but it keeps people honest because if they know you're gonna be checking on it, well, maybe I shouldn't put that company or, you know, because they're, you know, so it keeps people honest in a sense, I guess. It, it does. And, you know, and then we reinforce that torque technique um, really with each interaction because uh, with each interaction, whether it's a phone screen interview, 
you know, or eventually a, a career history interview, which we call a top grading interview with finalist candidates, we're actually talking about those former managers and we can uh, just uh, structure questions in a way that reinforces that we'll probably be talking with them. So when we do, what do you think they'll tell uh, us about you? So we, we use that. And that's our, that's our, our truth serum and it really works. Uh, you know, and then I'm going to fast forward to the end right before the job offer. We actually follow through with those reference calls and we ask uh, the candidates to arrange for them with uh, their former managers. And, um, you know, we call them personal reference calls because many companies have, in fact, probably most companies have policies against giving business references. So we call them personal references. Yeah, and what we found is, you know, those who are you know above average and certainly those who have were a players in previous jobs they can get their managers to talk um, and you know we, we we facilitate that by being available early in the morning maybe later in the the evening or afternoon or on the weekends when somebody's not necessarily sitting at their desk uh, to make them feel a little bit more comfortable about uh, being open and honest with us so those are two and that's actually the the second and the fifth uh, key steps are the, you know, letting people know that they're doing the references and then actually following through with them. When we ask the candidates to arrange the calls. We actually get to speak with people we want to uh, relatively easily. They're, they're expecting our call and they tend to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so then, so that was the, the, so that those are three out of five steps, first, second, and fifth. Uh, so after we let candidates know about the torque technique, the next thing we need to do, because resumes may or may not be complete, is we need to collect the full education and career history. And so this is one uh, thing we've created a tool over the years. Um, it used to be just a, a form in Word. Uh, we call it a career history form. We actually now have some software that uh, has the same content, but actually graphs that information so it can help with screening and then creates interview guides from it. And that's another thing that uh, you can try out for free. So we have a free trial of it. Uh, we'll let you try it out for one open position. Um, so you can get a feel for it. So mm. that's another thing they can do for free. Where can people the, find it, Chris? They can find that at, at topgrading.com uh, resources. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you can so, take a check that out. And that's kind of the career history stuff. Yes, so. It, it is. And so we get, uh, we have full visibility into every education uh, experience and every job they've had throughout their career uh, before we sit down and invest a lot of time with them. Because uh, the fourth and really the most powerful uh, part of top grading and really where top grading started is with the career history or the top grading interview. So the career history interview or top grading interview. It's a chronological, in depth, and structured interview that covers every education and work experience a person has had since they, uh, since they were in high school. And we only do these interviews with finalist candidates. So we need to do some screening interviews beforehand. And there's some variability there. Uh, clients do things differently uh, based on their industry and the level of the job and, and uh, their situation, really their size as well. Uh, but when we get down to the two or three finalist candidates, we need to spend uh, some significant time with them to get to know them well. Um, it's one place where typical hiring uh, processes, you know, if we even call it that, but you know, typical hiring processes fall short is the interactions with candidates are short, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And you have to make a choice in that short period of time. You can either go deeply into a couple of areas or we can stay at a very high level um, in many areas, but we never get to go both broad and deep with a candidate. The top grading interview allows us to do that. And with a top grading interview, we were leveraging some things we do really well as humans. One is learn from stories. You know, and essentially, we are getting candidates to tell us their, their story starting in high school and getting more in depth as we get to the, the recent history. We're also using something we do really well as humans, and that is our, our ability to recognize patterns and anomalies in those patterns. So when we're listening to a person's story, and we're asking them about high points and low points or accomplishments and mistakes of everything they've done, we get to see patterns. And we can then more accurately predict what they're going to be like in the situation you're looking to put them in. One other thing we're really good at as humans, and it's more, it's the Bayesian theorem uh, tends to be more associated with computing, but really our brains can do this as well. We have you know, billions of data points based on our experiences. And when we take a couple of other data points and uh, kind of enter them into the database, we can really accurately predict what comes next. Uh, we also suggest 
these career history interviews be done with two interviewers. So uh, we're, we're getting, we're having two people with two separate uh, experiential histories listening to this uh, information about the candidate and we can come up with even more accurate conclusions about that person. You know, and then fifth step is follow through with the reference calls. Uh, you know, by doing those five things, uh, our, our clients, our case study clients have uh, gotten to an 85% hiring success rate. What that means and what, what, what success for us is, is getting an A player in that role. So 85% of the time, they end up with a high performer who fits their culture. Yeah. And I mean, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong from, from the stuff I've researched from top grading, the typical is like 20%. Uh, maybe lower than that, 20% or lower, and the cost of not hiring an A player. Because what, like, what have you seen the cost? I mean, I've heard metrics thrown around like it's costing $100,000 that year. I don't know if that's true or not, just by not hiring the right person. So a few statistics there, uh, Jeremy. One on the, on the low end is the cost of turnover. So this is just what it costs to... Uh, replace someone uh, who leaves. You know, so it has nothing to do with mistakes that person made. It's just getting someone uh, into the company. And research shows that it uh, costs about 20% of the annual compensation um, just to, to, to get a new person in that position. Um, so that's on the, the low end, just sort of the mechanical cost of that turnover. Uh, but what we've found is that the real cost and the significant cost of a hiring mistake come in the, the missed opportunities and the mistakes and the disruption associated with having that non-A player in the role. And that can uh, range anywhere from one time, so 1X uh, annual compensation, you know, up to over 25, per, uh, 25 times annual compensation for an executive in a midsize or larger company. You know, and you think about the, uh, the, the difference in a Authority, you know, an entry level, you know, somebody making nine, 10, 12 bucks an hour has versus uh, the CEO of a company. And you can understand how, you know, why that range is so dramatically different. So, you know, the cost of a hiring mistake is frankly astronomical. And actually, that's another uh, thing I'd really recommend uh, people doing. And that's going, you know, go to our website or even Google, just or Google or search, uh, cost of mishire form. Uh, chances are our form will come up or you can find it on our website and resources. Uh, calculate it, you know, uh, uh, add up. Yeah. I'm looking doing. under, if you go to topgrading.com um, resources, there's a drop down that's cost of mishire calculator. That's it. Yep. That's what we recommend doing that. will uh, really highlight the, uh, the monetary cost, but also the, t the, the, the cost and wasted time, you know, so uh, how much time do you waste with a non A player? You know, for everyone listening, think about the number of hours per week that you and others wasted, you know, because that person, whoever you're thinking about, was not an A player, and then multiply it by the number of weeks they were in the job. Uh, you know, chances are you're wasting a couple or three or maybe even five plus hours per week. You know, you multiply that by a year and you wasted 250 hours. Uh, yeah. And so that loss of productivity factors into the monetary cost. Oh, too. totally. Yeah, it's, it's like two months of work weeks, you know. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, any red flags, you know, maybe obvious, maybe not obvious that, that you see or that people should look out for? Uh, this, this varies, uh, but, you know, on the extreme end, especially when we're talking about, uh, you know, positions, individual contributor, professionals, so accountants and engineers and, you know, salespeople and above managers and directors and executives, yeah, someone who has a relatively short job tenure recently, you know, so a bit of a job hopper, uh, that's a red flag. And, you know, we hear, uh, or I hear often uh, that times are changing and people don't stay in jobs as long, you know, but fact of the matter is if you have a manager and especially if you have an executive who uh, has been changing jobs every year to 18 months, uh, they haven't had the opportunity to you know, assess the situation, you know, figure out what the new strategy is, implement that strategy and stick around long enough to say that it worked or not. And so what you the, the way you want to look at that history is if someone has, let's say, uh, an average job tenure of 18 months over the past 10 years, 
you know, you need to ask yourself, is it okay if they stick around for only 18 months? Because their past history really points toward they're only being there for, you know, 18 months at the maximum. Yeah. So that's, that's the red flag. You know, another one uh, that, I, that I see often um, as at least a factor in a hiring mistake is you know, someone who has worked, you know, only at larger, uh, you know, at larger companies moving into a very small and entrepreneurial company, maybe even a startup. Um, and the, the percentage of success, the, the success percentage, it's actually really low there, you know, and vice versa. You know, someone who is work, used to working in a, a startup environment, moving into a larger, maybe more bureaucratic company, because larger companies need to be more bureaucratic with more controls, uh, that tends to uh, not work out very often as well. So, you know, the, 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 the message there is not, you know, don't hire people, people from big companies or don't hire people who have only worked in startups. It's, you know, have the evidence that points toward the person being effective in your environment. So, like be aware you know, as you're going through the process. Be aware, you know, be aware. This is going to, a red flag. Uh, I'm going to think of a very specific, uh, a specific example of a new, uh, with a new client. Uh, they need a, a new leader or a person for their leadership team. Yeah, and so that the position's open. Uh, we help them create the job scorecard. And when those positions are open, one other thing we do is think about what the key criteria are. You know, so key criteria meaning something I put someone's LinkedIn profile or their resume or something we could find out in the quick phone screen interview to say, yep, they have the potential to fit or not. Uh, this company is in a very rural area, rather large company in a very rural area. And so one of the key criteria is having to have lived in a rural area, at least at some point in their life, mm -hmm. have some experience there to say, yes, I, you know, I'd like to live in a rural area or not. And so it can be as simple as that, but, you know, getting, getting what someone has done in their past, you know, to point toward being a good fit and being able to do what you need them to do is really important. And so, it depends. It depends on the situation, yeah. but you know, having those gaps to fill be as narrow as possible is really yeah. important. No, but I like what you said with that. It could be different key criteria, but in that case, if they need the person to relocate to a rural area and they've only lived in New York City, you know, the odds of them maybe enjoying, I mean, less odds of them enjoying, hey, I'm going to go from New York City to this rural area, but if they grew up in some rural area, then then the likelihood is, oh, they've experienced that they know what they're getting into type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jeremy, not saying that that never works, you know, that, that you Well, why not just set yourself in the best case to succeed, right? Like, do you want to go with someone who's from New York City or do you want to go with someone who grew up for 18 years in a rural area, like if you have a choice between the two? Absolutely. And that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to minimize the risk factors, you know, and that's, that's certainly one way to do it. And really get one, one other thing, if this is all that is taken away, hopefully it's not, but if this is all that's taken away uh, is you know, to just be more conservative uh, with hiring decisions, you know, and, and conservative in the amount of risk that uh, is tolerable. You know, I, I see it so often, you know, we took a chance on that person. You know, we even, we knew that that was a weakness, but we took a chance and those chances of working out, uh, you know, a lot, lot more don't work out than actually do. Yeah. Chris, I want to talk about one example. I know we were talking before we hit record, um, just to give people maybe a full context, but, um, and you brought up Mariano's mm -hmm. as an example and, you know, what they came to you for and kind of how you, what you walk them through and, and what happened. And so uh, for those of those who might not be familiar with Mariano's, uh, it's a grocery store chain and a relatively new grocery store chain in uh, the Chicago area. Uh, and they were uh, created in, as a startup of a division of Roundy's supermarkets. So uh, they had about 150 stores in Wisconsin and Minnesota at that time. And Bob Mariano was the CEO. Uh, Bob Mariano was the president of Dominic's for uh, a long time in the 80s and 90s in the Chicago area. And so one of his uh, you know, goals and dreams was to get back into the Chicago grocery market with an upscale, you know, very service oriented uh, grocery store, kind of somewhere between uh, a big box grocery store and Whole Foods was what they were going for and actually what they what they achieved. And one part of Bob's vision was uh, to have just better service by a long margin than any of the other grocery stores. 
And so to back up a little bit, you know, when Bob arrived at Roundy's, uh, you know, shortly after that, uh, we re-engaged with him because we hadn't worked with him for a while uh, since he had left Dominix. And we, we helped really strengthen the leadership team. You know, it's a really important factor for the success of top grading and uh, ingraining the A player standard. It's to have a strong leadership team. You know, for one, because A players tend to not want to work for non A's, and uh, you know, if we were to go into a lot of effort hiring uh, the lower level, uh, getting the lower level hires right without having really good managers for them to work for, you know, those A players are going to leave and they're going to go find someone who, uh, you know, can help them fulfill their career goals. So once that happened, uh, yeah, the, the question was, all right, can, you know, can we use top grading to hire everyone in these new Mariano stores? Because we want the service to be, you know, fantastic and wonderful in relation to, you know, what the typical experience is. And we said, yes, I uh, think so. And we, we worked um, on a couple of their other store openings before that we went to the Marianos uh, on hiring and figuring out how to use top grading for, uh, for entry level cashiers and the people getting in the carts in from the, uh, from the, the parking lot. And we were able to do it. You know, we, we shortened the top grading interview. So for those, for anyone who reads top grading or has read top grading, you know, one of the things that tends to stick out is a long interview, you know, three or four hours. And it is actually three or four hours with executive level candidates without question can even be a little bit longer than that. But that amount of time is completely unnecessary for an entry level uh, hire. And so we abbreviated the process um, down to a half hour to 45 minutes for a top grading interview with finalist candidates, did a couple of reference calls. We still did the reference calls. And uh, what they found was uh, their service was in fact much better than uh, those grocery stores and their competitors in the area because they hired people you know, who didn't necessarily know how to work in the grocery store or have experience working in a grocery store, but who were really good interacting with people and had some dem the demonstrated ability to learn things relatively quickly. They said, you know, we can teach you what you need to know about working in the store. We can't teach you how to engage and interact uh, and uh, you know, be warm with our work with our customers. And you know, before Kroger bought Mariano's, uh, they were known for their service. You know, they had wonderful food and great fresh food, and it was a, a good store um, and a well-run store. But their service was why you know people keep coming back. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want you to touch on some ways that people listening can interact with you and the company. You know, one is obviously getting the top grading book. Um, which is amazing. Um, you can get an Audible, Amazon, probably at a bookstore somewhere. Um, but you also have workshops. You also have coaching software implementation. So if you could touch a little bit on each of those, just so people get an idea of, and I know you've, I, I said, like, conducted over 2,500 of these assessments and worked, you know, you essentially run the workshop, have run the workshops. So Maybe start with the workshops and we'll just, just touch on each of those, how people can interact with, with top grading. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, Jeremy, I'm going to leave the workshops for somewhere in the middle of the- Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the middle of the offerings, uh, because as I, as I just mentioned, uh, one of the keys to um, you know, top grading in the A player uh, standard really working in a company is having a strong leadership team. And so that's really where we start. We tend to you know, engage with uh, CEO or president or owner uh, to start with and, and uh, yeah, do what we need to do to get that leadership team strong you know, and the individuals that A players really want to, uh, to work for. So you know, how do we do that? We do assessment and feedback and coaching you know, and get people to really reach their full potential. We also really get to know their different leadership styles and management styles. So when we're helping assess candidates for hire, uh, we can match those people well. So that's where we start. You want to take care of the foundation first, first, which is the leadership team. I gotcha. Absolutely. You know, and as we're doing that, we also, you know, as I said, I, I did, I've done it 2,500. It's much more than that. Now I need to probably update that a little bit. That was, <laughs> it's like 10,000. You're like, that was written I, like 19, 19 years ago. <laughs> Not quite 10,000, but uh, it's more than 2,500. But I spend my lo a lot of my time 
uh, assessing finalist candidates for senior positions for our clients, kind of as the, the final quality check or the insurance policy to be sure that those hiring mistakes at the top are avoided. Uh, so those are two ways that we engage, you know, kind of actually do do that work. You know, and then lower in the organization is where our workshops and training come in. So uh, what we found, and this goes back to uh, really Brad's book, it was a bit before my time, but Brad Smart's book, the founder of Top Grading, uh, with GE in the 90s, uh, where they found that, um, you know, even that managers uh, trained, you know, through in a, in a workshop model, you know, and then coached through a couple of interviews can get results that are nearly as good as top grading professionals lower in the organization. So for managers and individual, individual contributors, uh, what we found is really important there is having the two interviewers. So two interviewers uh, interviewing one candidate and uh, you know, with some practice and some training, they can uh, get some really, really uh, uh, dramatic re uh, improvement in results. So our workshop is the first step, you know, and then uh, we help execute uh, those steps for some period of time until you don't need us anymore. So we do coaching interviews, you know, we help create job scorecards. And then we also have some software that uh, facilitates the execution of top grading. You know, and I said, we tend to uh, interact or engage with, uh, with CEOs and pre presidents and owners. We do, you know, they are, they are ultimately our clients. We work very, very closely though, um, and, and intimately with uh, HR teams and, and CHROs and heads of HR. And we've actually uh, got something that, uh, really helps uh, make the lives of the HR team better, especially in the, the screening process uh, when they are getting candidates in from those job boards. And so we have some really, uh, really slick screening software that helps with that too. So those cool. are the main ways that uh, they, they can engage. I mean, the easiest way to, is to uh, you know, give us a call. And if you have some, any, any desire to improve your hiring, you know, and we can talk through what the, the best approach and the, the best way to introduce top hiring can be. First of all, Chris, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been amazing, um, very informative, and people should check out topgrading.com. Um, I just want to leave people with, if there's anything else that we should, any other parting words. Um, I'm also curious of any um, books or resources in general that you have looked on in your career that have been helpful. Maybe it's not specifically in hiring, but adjunctive um, maybe skill sets or other things. Um, are there any other books or resources that, that people should check out? Obviously top grading the book by, like we, we mentioned, um, Brad, um, who founded this company and, um, any other books or resources outside of, you know, Brad smarts top grading that we should think about looking at. So, you know, books, uh, there are a couple of uh, great ones. Uh, one is Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Uh, another, yeah, it's an oldie but a goodie, uh, good to great. You know, there's some good stuff in there without question. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and, and in terms of interviewing, you know, I often get a, get a question about uh, body language. What, what part does body language play? A great book, uh, if the title is what everybody, P-O-D-Y, is saying. Um, and unfortunately, the author's name is escaping me right now. That's all right. Former, People could Google it. Everybody is escape, is is yeah. It's a former FBI profile uh, interrogator. Mm. And uh, really interesting. It's a fun read uh, and uh, a way you can do a little analyzing when you're uh, having a cocktail party when we can eventually do that again. Nice. Thank you, Chris. Um, any other parting words on um, top grading general, maybe that you want to highlight or that we haven't mentioned? I, I have two, two things, Jeremy. And, and one is, you know, whether it's top grading or some other process, uh, strongly, strongly recommend that you have a hiring process. You know, our, our clients have processes and metrics for almost everything in their business. So often, though, hiring um, is you, uh, the individual managers are given almost free reign to do what they want in the hiring process. So have a process, have it structured. You know, it, it results in a great candidate experience and just having a structure that you can replicate and test and tweak will help you hire better. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, you know, a little bit, uh, it, not even a little bit, it's connected with sort of the environment we're in you know, right now and you know, understanding that 
you know, hiring is not uh, necessarily a top priority, but to just have everyone think about uh, number one, when hiring comes back, because it will, it will eventually come back, uh, you know, have, be ready, be ready for it and, you know, get ready for it. Uh, but also, you know, especially um, if uh, you, know, you do have some open positions, um, this could potentially be one of the best uh, recruiting environments that we've experienced in the last 10 years. You know, people are going to- Maybe 100 be, years, Chris. It could be, you know, it very well could be. Um, you know, we're all at home and, uh, you know, some people might be a bit nervous about the future in terms of, uh, in terms of their jobs and much more willing to take those calls you know, if you have open positions now, or you anticipate having open positions once uh, once uh, everything gets sort of turned back on, and we can we can start interacting as normal. So everyone, check out top grading with six out for me, Chris. Is there's a lot of nuggets here, but um, just listing the results with metrics for when you do the instead of just a job description, I think is huge, right? Because yeah. we just kind of put out the description. Actually thinking through the results we want in general is helpful, but also putting them in a job description. So you're high, you know, hiring for a results-based person and also they know what to expect as well. So that's a big, big takeaway for me among other things. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time and everyone check out topgrading.com and in the book Top Grading. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.